When we speak about the attitudes that we must develop in saving others, how does Jude help us with that? What does he say when he, we're talking about building ourselves up in the most holy faith, pray, praying in the Holy Spirit, looking forward to the, the resurrection from the dead and the eternity with, with the Lord? He goes in to talk about, well, you're going to be saved. What about the other people? And so how does he express our then wanting to, to reach the other people who are not solidly involved in and uh, stay within the love of God by keeping his commandments. What, what's the attitude that we should have? Do you, you see something called, might be, uh, cared about people may not have the confidence that you have? Maybe people, what about people in doubt? What are we supposed to do with them? Can I have mercy upon them? Realizing, hey, we're, we can have times of doubt. Asaph had it, inspired writer. Psalm 73, my feet almost slipped. I, I was looking at things around me, and he had to get in touch with the, with the counsel of God and realize those people out there, they're on a slippery slope that all of a sudden they're going to be in eternal damnation. I don't want to be with them. I don't envy them. And so there is a wonderful psalm to realize there are people can have doubts. And what was so wise about Asaph, he didn't go, go around expressing his doubts to others. That's another side. If we have doubts, uh, get a hold of somebody that can help you with that. Don't spread your doubts around all the congregation because it may affect another weak person. And he said, I'm glad I didn't do that. And that was wisdom. And so we can learn when we're on, we have doubts, not be ashamed of that, solve it. And let's solve it before I communicate all my doubts to everybody else. And then realize that I come, I'm going to solve it is come to the counsel of, of God. And, but I can be merciful to those and realize, you know, you're not the first one who had doubts. You're not the first one who had doubts about the resurrection of the body. I mean, Paul wrote things that are hard to understand. And that's one of them. How in the world could you bring forth from people who have been obliterated and they don't even have a body when they died and, they're, and now they're going to have a, a body raised from the, from the ashes. And uh, they can begin to have doubts about that. Well, you can have mercy on that. There's an attitude about that. Do you see urgency involved in our attitude? Urgency? What do you do when you're snatching people out of the fire? That's urgency. You know where they're heading. You know what, what, what's going to be happening to them. And, and when the Lord comes back and you're looking forward to that, looking for his mercy when the Lord returns and keeping me strong in, in his teachings, there's other people that they're on, they're on their way to, to hell. And so you want to make sure you have the urgency whenever up, you have the opportunity. Sometimes people don't allow you that opportunity, but when you, when you can, it, it can happen. Sometimes I've... Uh, Heard one, one preacher say that his opportunity came when his neighbor wanted to know where his dog went when he died because he cared about his dog. Was there, is there a doggy heaven? Well, that opened the door for him to, to teach his neighbor, and finally he taught him the truth. But it can come from all sorts of things. People turn you off, and all of a sudden they have a death in the family. There's something that you could plant a seed to realize here's some reality in our lives, and here, here's something that God says we can do about that. But there must be the urgency. Every time I, you know, it used to be when I'd pull out of the driveway, there'd be people going to church. I don't, it may be different in your neighborhood, but my neighborhood, I'm by myself, except for Beth. And we come, we sometimes leave the neighborhood at the same time. Sometimes she beats us there. But I don't see a lot of people coming out of the neighborhoods like I used to do. Uh, that we're going to church somewhere. I don't stop at a stoplight and see someone dressed up. I said, well, they're probably going to Baptist church. That's the big one down here. But not, I don't see that at all, uh, all as, as a normal thing. So we're living in a time where we, we talk about the postmodern world, the post-Christian world, and um, that people don't see a need for that. And that becomes the, the point. There's an urgency that whenever I have an opportunity, I need to try to create an interest in, in the people around me, especially that I wave to and say hi to in, in my neighborhood. 
And so there, there's the urgency because we know what lies ahead. And then when you do have the opportunity to help someone that's in sin to come out of sin, what should be our attitude? Have mercy with what? Fear. Fear of what? I could be spotted by that sin. So there's a humility that will extend the mercy, but it's like in Galatians 6, look into your old self lest you also be tempted. When you're trying to bring one to, to a place of, of usefulness again, that's restoring someone. It's like mending a net. They got a whole net in their net. We just mend that. And you're restoring someone to usefulness like a mended net is a concept in Galatians. And what you see here is the same thing, have, have mercy with fear, because we want to keep ourselves unspotted. What is pure and undefiled religion? Help the needy, but also keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And he will speak at the end of this chapter of, of one, the only chapter we have, about blemishes, unspotted. Sin is a blemish, and that becomes something that we want. We don't want to be tarnished by that. I don't know how many times, and sometimes this happens with preachers who begin to, well, I'm going to be a counselor. I'm going to be a marriage counselor. And they get caught up in adultery, fornication, because you get too close to the situation, and there, there becomes a sympathy for one, and a lot of times the, the, the preacher and the, and the woman and having trouble with her husband and all those things, there becomes that emotional contact. You're not careful about that. I know more than one that's, that's fallen into to that, that trap. And uh, there's the dangers of being a, a counselor. You, you know, we're preachers, but there's, there's that danger, well, I just wanna help and that's fine. But we have to be a, a aware all the time of, of that type of uh, temptation that comes. And it just shows an awareness, but there is showing the mercy, and that comes from a, a sense of kindness as seeing where they're coming from and realize I could be coming from that same place, so I will have mercy because I like people to have mercy upon me. But then there comes the urgency. And you know what, sometimes when we get discouraged because we've been turned down so often, we've been, we've been, We've, we've had our hopes that something would be, would come of this and it doesn't. And we just keep trying and we keep trying and we keep trying. You know what wanes sometimes? Our urgency. It's almost like there's no use. And so we quit having that urgency. We've got to keep it going. Because you never know what you're doing that seems so unfruitful at the moment will ring in, in, the, in the people's minds at a certain time in their life, and they at least will have been exposed to that. And what happens when we don't offer the word of God to people? That we just listen to man's wisdom. That, that, becomes, that becomes trite a lot of times. It's just same old thing, you know, they, they just go over and over because that's what they're supposed to say, and it doesn't have an impact. And one of the benefits of being in a postmodern world where people don't know the Bible, just, just do a little Bible, and people, I hadn't heard that. I, haven't, I, I didn't, didn't know that's what uh, was found in the Bible. Because what are you doing? You're bringing something that they haven't been exposed to. They've been exposed to culture. They've been exposed to man's wisdom. People that don't care about God. But God's wisdom is there. And it's always going to uh, be there. And it's good for every generation. And we just need to be able to to say, I, I think this could apply here and, and uh, do the best we can. And that will be a life well lived when you get through living. You will have had the urgency, you'd have shown the mercy, and you have been, you've been very circumspective not to get caught up emotionally that will lead you into sexual immorality or other, other sins that might come. Any, any comments on those attitudes? And it's interesting, Jude says, now you build yourself up, and then he goes right in. Now, but also you involve trying to save others. And sometimes we say, I'll just build myself up, and I'm, I'm not going to be too worried about the world out here. Contend earnestly for the faith, and part of that is sharing that with other people. And that becomes very, very, very important. Why is it important to dwell and meditate upon the, the character of God? We continue through these last verses. 
Let's just, let's look at verse uh, four, 14. I know what God is. God is, four letter word, able. That's the character of God. He's able. Able to do what? He's able to guard you from stumbling. Well then, God, how come I'm stumbling? How come I, I sin? In fact, I'm a liar if I say I haven't sinned. That didn't change, that didn't change the, the character of God, but I know he's able to do that. He is strong enough to do that. What, what did Jesus teach us to pray? Lead us not in temptation, but do what? Deliver us. Well, God doesn't tempt any man with evil. How come he says that? The point is, don't allow me to be tempted by the devil and you leave me, you leave me when I don't have any power. Deliver me. It wasn't just say, uh, you know, I didn't, just don't, don't tempt me. We're, go, we're gonna be tempted and God allows that. And God tests that. He tests Abraham. But deliver me. I, want, I don't want to be succumbed to the temptations of the devil. And so then we begin to realize that there's, there's a point about what we're doing. Where does God's power to keep us from stumbling say we have nothing to do with that? He just, he's able, and if he doesn't, it's not my fault. <laughs> we know that's not true. So what, what do we bring to the table when I reflect upon it? He's able to keep me with strong from stumbling. Then what do I need to be listening to? Hmm, what did he tell me to do that says I will never stumble? Maybe I need to listen to God. He's able to. And so what is, what is the point that he gives in Peter? I'll add to my faith virtue, my virtue knowledge and knowledge. I grow and he that grows in these things, he's that abound in these things, he shall never stumble. I gotta grow. Spiritually, that's gonna be my goal. In the midst of my growing spirits, I'm gonna make mistakes, that sort of thing. He has, he has a, a, an answer for that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. And we repent and we pray, we get back up. And we, we go another day. And you begin to put together the, the teachings of God's word and then keep yourself in the love of God. That was my responsibility. God's able to keep me from stumbling, but I'm keeping myself in the love of God. And so when you see me keeping myself in the love of God, what else am I doing to keep myself in the love of God? And it's, it's, it's what manifests if you love God or not. What is it? If you keep my commandments. The love of God has been perfected. The love of God is, is manifested when we keep his commandments. That's something I can do. Part of his commandments is grow. Grow spiritually. I hope that's why you come to every Bible class. I want to learn something. I may be reminded of something, but I want to be learning something. I want to be uh, maybe exhorted in a certain way. That's what we're doing now. That, that I can be, be stronger in the Lord. He's able. God is able to keep me from stumbling. God, God is over Satan. Satan always has to ask permission in the Bible. He always has to ask permission of God before he does something. Now he tempts us with evil and God allows that. I don't, God said, I don't tempt any man with evil. I can't be tempted with evil. So there's a sense of what he allows to take place but he's able to overcome that. And the beautiful thing about the plan of salvation, when, when Jesus says, now it's the hour of darkness. You got me, take me, you're gonna take me to the leaders, I know what you're gonna do. You're, you're going to convict me and you're going to crucify me. And that's your hour. And they think, we got rid of Jesus. But what was that? That was the plan of God. According to his foreknowledge, he was delivered up to ungodly men it's just so interesting that God defeats Satan at his own game. I'm going to destroy Jesus. And yet God had already planned. That's the route for being victorious. And what does Hebrews 2 say, say to us? That he destroyed the works of the devil who had the fear of, had the power of the fear of death. He took that out of the way. Because we don't have to fear death. We've overcome it in Christ. We raised. So 
all of the teachings of the Bible come together and there are commands, there's, there's wisdom to follow. And, but it's good to reflect, God, I know I'm encouraged because if I put on the whole armor of God, I have, I have the equipment now to withstand the devil. And when I withstand with him, you told me he'll flee from me for that moment. And I'll just live my life that way. And you can be victorious. He can keep you from stumbling. But we have to, we have to be involved in, in, in doing our part. And that becomes uh, very, very important. What's the second thing he can do in this verse? He's able to keep us, or keep us from, from stumbling. But he's what he's also able to do. Set you before his presence. So we're going to come to his presence. I, I pictured the judgment. I pictured being for the judgment seat of, of God and judgment seat of Christ. And he'll present me there without what? Without fault or blemish. Uh, with exceeding joy. And most of the time we think of the judgment as trepidation of, of, of uncertainty. Joy. See him as he is. There's a confidence that we have as, as, as Christians. As we're struggling, we're not perfect, but we know how to, to live our lives. We can go to the judgment and realize that he can set me before his, his presence without blemish. How, do, how could I do that? Because... I admit when I'm wrong, I, I should admit, and I confess it, I, I'm, I'm saying I have done that, I've contradicted your word, I pray for forgiveness, and he said, I will forgive you. And you say those prayers at night, and uh, re reflect on your day, start the day off reflecting on the day, and make sure you're dealing with those sins that you're aware of. And if, it's, well, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know, well, I can pray God, if I have sinned, I, I don't sit there and say, well, God forgive me for my un, unknowledgeable sins. The Bible never does that when we're made aware of it. So what can I pray? I can pray, God, I, today I, I don't see my sins. <laughs> if you do, let me know it so I can deal with it. Just humbly talk to God and realize that we can go through life. We don't have to sin. But we can go through life, and while we're growing, knowing that we're not perfect, but we have room to grow in our faith and knowledge and self-control, all of those things, we're going to falter. But putting that all, all together, we can live with confidence. And Jude uh, indicates that. But what helps me, God is able, God, he's able to set me before his presence. And that's, that's what we should be looking forward to. Instead of, oh, you know, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm going to stand before the holy God, uh, creator of all things. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense that maybe we need to encourage our hearts. I can do that without blemish because of God's grace and his plan, salvation, to keep imperfect people from going to hell, even after we become Christians. And then to be able to do that with joy. And that's the way we should be. Yes. Yeah. That's how we regard ourselves. That's a good thing. And that, that gets back to meditating upon it and remembering it, things like that. And that gets older. We get older, it gets difficult. So we have to really, we have to keep reading. We have to do that as long as we can. Any, any comments? Anybody else have a, a question or a comment? Okay. Is God the Father and at the same time our Savior? Who's your Savior? Who do we usually think? Well, Jesus is not the Father, is he? Well, help me with the scripture. What does the Bible say? God, our Savior. And how did we know that he did not speak about Jesus being our Savior at this moment? Because it's through Jesus. So I need to think, God's my Savior. How often do you think about that? 
Oh, oh it's Jesus Christ. They all can't. No, it, it, distinguish it. God is our Savior. By the grace of God, we've been saved. Why can't he be our Savior? He's God, and Jesus is, is God, but they're distinguished from one another. It is interesting the phraseology that indeed God is able to keep us from stumbling. He's able to, because of his grace and his mercy. But it's through Jesus who saved us from our sins because what did he do? The Father didn't get on the cross, but who is the image of the Father? Distinct personalities who took on flesh and blood. He did. And he gets credit for it too. It's through Jesus Christ. God our Savior through Jesus Christ. And here's a passage that says, God's my Savior too. And, and understand why you can make that statement scripturally. Because you, you're looking at it scripturally that way. How is God's eternal and timeless nature described in the realm of time? So he's timeless, but how does he describe it here for us? Yes. He has his power, divinity, all this stuff. He has it. How, how does he do that? I, I got the present now and forevermore, but what was the first one? Yeah, before time. That's how weak it's, we, we, it's hard to get our grasp of that. God's eternal. He's never had a beginning or an end. He's always been, and uh, he always will be. And that's why he's always present. Uh, and it's hard to grasp, but we say, well, before time, you know, he, had, he has this, this power and divinity. And we ask the question, has God always had glory, majesty, and dominion and power? Has he always had that? Yes. He's always had that. And angels got out of line. Well, did they, they overcome God? Devil never overcame God. He's a, and when, what Jesus did when he was resurrected, ascended upon high, he had power over the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. He has power over all things because God has always had that. But it's through Jesus' sacrifice that he cleansed heaven and opened the way in which uh, everything could be cleansed in, in heaven and upon earth. And that's uh, the beautiful thing of what, what Jesus did. Okay. Isaiah speaks about the fact that when the sons of men were gathered and saw the, the stars created, or saw the heavens created. He was before, they were before creation of earth. And I, I think there was a sense of, of that. They, they were present to see God's creation. So from that one passage, I, I'm, I'm reasoning, so well, you know, could it be before there was a, a universe created, the heavens and the earth that we know, that was the bigger reality of eternity. And before God ever said, here's beginning, they always were, were there. They'd already defeated themselves in hierarchy. That's why we have, when man's created, there's the devil. Okay, fallen angel, we talk, we talk about that. But I think of a broader universe that God has always existed in before he created this one. We're, we're in this dimension, and God's in this one, and the angels occupied that before we came into being. And I don't have the passage of Isaiah right now on my, tip, my, my tongue, but it's, it's, I, I think it's Isaiah, and uh, some of the Proverbs speaks about the wisdom of God. Wisdom was there when uh, uh, God created things, and, and the other passages dealing with the, the sons of men. Now, if the sons of, sons of men... How could they be there before creation? So I'm, sometimes they're, they're dealing with, with their created beings, but they were angels. So angelic beings have always been around there before the world came. That's hard for us to grasp. But Anybody have the passage where they were gathered? I'll, I'll get it for you. We'll, we'll do that. Well, we, we, at least next Wednesday. 
Lord willing, I'll, or for maybe Sunday we'll do that. Any any comments or not to add?